Hello, I'd like to welcome you to our session. My name is Nick Witchie. I am with the Western Literature Organization, Western Literature Association. And uh, this is our panel today. We're calling it Stuck in Motion, Movement and Placement in the American West. I will introduce our speakers as they prepare to make their presentation. So if you joined in here at the beginning to get everybody line, to understand who everybody is, I'm actually asking you to scroll forward and find uh, the, you know, go to the talk if you want to attend a specific talk. Um, uh, our first speaker is Scott Hendry. I just lost another screen. Scott will begin his doctoral studies in literature at the University of Arkansas in the fall. He just finished an MA in literature and cultural studies at the University of, Cal Color uh, University of Oklahoma, pardon me, centering his work upon the rhetorics of place and space, indigenous and decolonial literature, and critical theory. Scott will focus his PhD research upon the varied literatures of the American West, literary cartography, geocriticism, and sociocultural spatial theory. Scott Hendry. Take it, Scott. All right, thank you, Nick. Share the screen and be ready to begin. Can everybody see this? Okay. Places are essential to our narratives as we experience and navigate the worlds in which we exist. The central argument of this presentation is that place me may be conceptualized as a storied event in process. Phenomenologist and geospatial philosopher Jeff Malpas states, quote, the crucial point about the connection between place and experience is not that place is properly something only encountered in experience, but rather that place is integral to the very structure and possibility of experience, end quote. As we consider the novel There, There by Cheyenne and Arapaho writer Tommy Orange, I hope to show that place may be understood as a continuous unfolding process, and that within this open-ended process, it is instructive to interpret and represent place as a storied event. We continually experience the powerful, beautiful, atrocious, and tragic proliferation of places. And in so doing, we begin to attune ourselves to the emergent stories that arise from our relationality to these place events. While our stories are most certainly embedded in place, it's equally important to emphasize the reflexive notion that place is embedded in our stories. Stories both give rise to and shape the creation and interpretation of place. Then additionally, stories are empowering and that they can create the possibility for agency and relationality. Acknowledging and attempting to understand this storied nature is important to my literary reconceptualization of place here today. As we tell and inherit and hear stories, we inevitably participate in place by inhabiting the life worlds that develop in connection to these generative, ongoing, interconnected narratives. Places and event happens as we engage with stories, as we experience and create what cultural geographer Edward Soha calls the real and imagined spaces of our lives. Stories are the vessels that enable us to experience meaningful being in the worlds or places within which we live. More often than not, place has traditionally been associated with physical localities that can be graphically mapped. The present reconceptualization suggests that place is exceedingly more than a fixed, limited geospatial sphere or location or thing, and that places may be potential event sites for both relationality and transformation. Stories enable us to inhabit worlds and experience transformation and relationality at sites and create and interpret geographies. And yet notions of worlds and sites and geographies may be understood in multiple equally valid and important ways. What happens to the storied nature of place events if place is not interpreted strictly as a physical geographical location? How may place be both storied and an event if place means an urban or a digital space? How relevant is place today when we consider what Melanie Benson Taylor calls, quote, the unmoored sensibility of contemporary identity? I hope to demonstrate that Tommy Orange is there. There has tremendous potential to greatly enhance our appreciation of the storied character of atypical place events. When we consider both the multi-generic life worlds the work presents and the novel's overt eschewing of traditional spatial or place-based sensibilities. Through an inventive blending of fictional narrative presentations, and non-fictional meta-narrative commentaries, the novel creates representations of place and indigenous identity that enrich our notion of storied places, particularly when these places are urban. There, there creates an interwoven tapestry of contemporary indigenous lives in and around Oakland, California. 
The novel is comprised of 13 narrative perspectives and two nonfiction essays in the form of a prologue and an interlude. The book is a conglomeration of interrelated stories that unfold in a uniquely indigenous dialectic of place, placelessness, locality, spatiality, digital networking, and displacement. These native characters have not vanished. They're not artifacts. They've not disappeared. They're not ashamed and they are striving and struggling and flourishing in their own places. They're legitimately and authentically native in all the ways we may interpret their disparate identities. Alcatraz and Oklahoma and Oakland and New Mexico and other places appear in the stories. And yet as Choctaw and Pawnee scholar Stephen Sexton notes, quote, they're there effaces the place-based spatial logics that have long aligned authenticity with location in traditional and inevitably rural settings, end quote. One of the most notable phrases from there, there appears in the remarkable prologue. At the end of an account of urbanity, wherein we're told that for urban Indians, the land moves with you like memory, these sweeping claims are made. Being Indian has never been about returning to the land. The land is everywhere or nowhere. For many indigenous peoples, the land is specifically somewhere. For others, like the characters in there, there, the land may be distantly somewhere, but it's more everywhere or nowhere more an unreturnable covered memory than a daily geographical spatial reality, more an urban or digital space than a rural or physical locality. And in this sense, the novel opens up the possibility of interpreting place as a consequential geography, according to Edward Soha's definition, a spatial expression that is more than just a background reflection or a set of physical attributes to be descriptively mapped. Significantly, the spatial expressions there, there do not nullify any place-based spatial logics. And as we reconceptualize place, we're not forced into a binary exclusivity and that we must always and, and definitively identify a place as either one, a geophysical site, or two, a spatial expression, digital, urban, ceremonial, spatial expression not directly tied to locality. Instead, interpreting place events as socially constructed consequential geographies makes it possible for us to emphasize both conceptions and to do so if necessary at the same time. As we embrace the provocatively poetic assertion that the land is everywhere or nowhere, we may readily understand the urban narratives of there, there as spatialized threads. And I suggest that there, there creates possibilities for relationality, transformative activism, and social change in three ways. By one, narratively digitizing and urbanizing the place. Two, spatializing identity in ways that develop indigeneity through technology and urbanity. And three, creating the potential for social change via relationality and the creation of community through story by incorporating multimodal spatial expressions. Plenty of us are urban now, we read in the prologue, if not because we live in cities, then because we live on the internet, it says. Although the primary geographical setting of the novel is Oakland, many of the narrative presentations in there there are oriented to place through technological modes or ways of being. The novel is centered upon carefully articulated presentations of decidedly urban places that are understood to be no less earthy or traditional than a rural landscape or a reservation. Both the general place events of Oakland and the specific place event of the Big Oakland powwow are urban spaces that are mediated to and by the characters in large part through technological storytelling. The urban geographies of the characters in the novel take on material form mainly in and through technological creativity or communication. As Steve Sexton notes, quote, in this redefinition of the term urban as a function of digital interconnectivity rather than simply a city setting, there there offers a powerful pushback on the logics of place conventionally linked to native belonging. And yet it does not dispense entirely with the, with the specificity and significance of place, end quote. The pushback is essentially an awareness of place as more than geography or geophysical location. The urban narratives become spatialized events, whether mediated through technology or other cultural forms, as places are engaged by the characters in multitudes of ways. These engagements happen in both physical places and digital spaces. And each place or space invites participation in their processual storied unfolding. They're there in its own manner and in unexpected ways, presents place as a storied event and process. Earlier, I suggested that there, there spatializes identity by developing and promoting indigeneity through technology. I think we witnessed this spatial development most clearly in the narratives of the character Dean Oxendine. Dean strives to create and promote indigenous community by documenting the stories of native peoples in Oakland. 
This project is one of anti-assimilationist self-determination. He invites Native Americans to participate in place and to consolidate an indigenous community by telling their stories. Of course, our understandings of place need not be limited to maps and official canonized histories. We may follow Laura Furlan and shift this conversation to think instead about new spatial encounters. As Edward Soha says, quote, our geographies, like our histories, take on material form as social relations become spatial, but are also creatively represented in images, ideas, and imaginings. Much like it does with place, the novel complicates notions of Native American identity. As Matt Cohen observes, quote, there there offers a version of American Indian identity that comes without a master key of authenticity or cultural policing codes. It's hard and what will feel to many readers like a new way to parse what Indian means in there there, end quote. Dean spatializes identity by working on a film project wherein he will invite Native Americans to share their stories about what it is like or what it means or how it feels to be Native in Oakland. The stories will not be placed in a physical location in Northern California. Rather, they'll be located online in cyberspace. While Oakland is central and necessary to the documentary project, it is not entirely sufficient. In the novel, Dean is awarded the grant that will allow him to undertake the documentary film project it's focused upon collecting stories that can bring together the community of Oakland, the indigenous community, and be experienced by people outside of that particular place. And as he engages with Orville, Calvin, Blue, Edwin, and others, Dean is spatializing identity and attempting to establish a community network through digital storytelling. The volunteers are participating in the place event of Oakland as they share their stories about Oakland. And this location as a participatory spatialized venue becomes embedded in their narratives and their histories go beyond physical geographies as they are culturally mediated in and through digital media. The narrative unfolding of the novel is animated most significantly by the storied event of the Big Oakland powwow. Orange's characters are participants in the multi-directionality of cultural unfolding. And while some of them come in a good way, not all of their motivations for engaging with or in the powwow are unselfish and good. The menace of settler colonial violence literally and metaphorically erupts at the Big Oakland powwow, altering an overtly optimistic interpretation of indigenous relationality. And this haunting manifestation is an anticipated throughout the novel. The ending of the novel leaves readers, both native and non-native alike, contemplating what sort of book they've just finished. Though the powwow offers the possibility for hybridity and relationship, the narrative never resolves into hybridity. There is always the sense of a suspended possibility that is disrupted by violence. The interlude insists that the quote tragedy of it all will be unspeakable, but the book is not entirely tragic. Rather, in its decolonizing representations of Native Americans as present tense people, it leaves one feeling with a feeling, quote, not unlike hope. The ironic and even satirical enunciation of colonial violence in the interlude, the powwow. I think is one of Orange's most brilliant decolonizing strokes. The novel highlights the striking fractures between powwow participants and between native and non-native readers in the non-fictional meta-commentaries, the prologue and the interlude, enabling us to interpret the storied event of the Big Oakland powwow as a blending of imagination and immediacy. Through a striking usage of changing verb tenses and pronoun shifts, the interlude appropriates the fictional Big Oakland powwow in order to consider the haunting specter of settler colonialism and its attendant violence. The meta-commentary tells its own decolonial story. In the opening section of the interlude, it's titled Powwows. The first line reads, for powwows, we come from all over the country. Spatial theorist Robert Talley argues, quote, there need not be any one-to-one -one correspondence between the referential space outside the text and the representations within it, end quote. Orange exploits this notion and uses the interlude to help make sense of his own world. The reader recognizes that the commentary is identifying Native Americans as the we in the narrative, and that the powwow, the places where identities are self-determined, where this kind of intertribal gathering offers the means for what Visner calls survivance as an active sense of presence and a renunciation of dominance, tragedy, and victimhood. The narration points to this active sense of presence. We keep powwowing because there aren't very many places where we get to all be together, where we get to see and hear each other. The novel is representing the possibility for indigenous relationality at storied events such as powwows. And then quite unexpectedly, the interlude drops a conceptual bomb. 
we, we all came to the Big Oak One Pow Wow for different reasons. We've been coming for miles. We've been coming for years, generations, lifetimes. The meta commentary extracts readers from fiction and then positions them in the middle of a reality that is being mediated by a native lens. The account is more than fictional. It takes a historical turn that is oriented toward the present. Now the interlude is telling a story that we haven't been telling all this time. It says that we haven't been listening to. It's a story that in every way stands in distinct decolonizing contradiction to the official history of settler colonialism. The interlude then abruptly entraps non-native readers in the story. We is now juxtaposed with you. If you have the option to not think about or even consider history, whether you learned it right or not, or whether it even deserves consideration, if you were fortunate enough to be born into a family whose ancestors directly benefited from genocide and or slavery, maybe you think the more you don't know, the more innocent you can stay, which is a good incentive not to find out. Settlers are now unavoidably being unsettled. The you of the narrative refers to non-native readers who have directly participated in the colonial project. The you of settler coloniality is being confronted by accident of birth and the implicit and often explicit avoidance of historical acknowledgement. The interlude is saying that these non-native readers contribute to the degradation of non-settler others and to the continued marginalizing of subaltern individuals. Orange's decolonizing literary project is herein enacting social criticism. The interlude and prologue both identify areas where people are dispossessed, marginalized, oppressed, or cast out. They emphasize these situations through artistic expression and narrative representation, and they invite Native and non-Native readers alike to become involved in the complex processes of reconstructing these instances of oppression. The work challenges us to interpret the violence and disharmony that explode at the Big Oakland powwow as a manifestation of timeless and placeless settler coloniality that shades contemporary experience. The novel is a self-determining performance of transformative activism. It embodies a counter narrative and it challenges non-native readers to reorient their notions of native identity and agency. It acknowledges that after the disruption of settler colonialism, quote, the history of what actually happened became a new kind of history, end quote. There, there participates in a counter history and it offers alternate narratives of Native Americans as modern, relevant, and alive. These narrative presentations attempt to transform Native Americans' relationships to place and their identities from the past to the present, from archaic and isolated imaginings to a sense or feeling of vibrant immediacy. The novel undoubtedly presents place as a storied event, and it's also representative of Walter Mignolo's decolonizing attempt to, quote, build a world in which many worlds will coexist, end quote. The novel enables multiple marginalized stories, histories, outlooks, and processes to merge and converge in an ongoing network of relationality. And in this sense, there there is a defiant act of decolonial placemaking and identity construction. Indigenous identities, epistemologies, and stories are foregrounded and privileged, and the novel creates what Edward Soha says are, quote, new sites for struggle and for the construction of interconnected and non-exclusionary communities of resistance, end quote. The communities in the novel resist colonial hegemony primarily through storytelling. In fact, the individual stories of the characters and the overarching story of the novel serve as a powerful counter discourse to the promulgated misrepresentations of Native Americans in US settler colonial society. As Dean Oxendine says, that's what I'm trying to get out of this whole thing, all put together all our stories, because all we got right now are reservation stories, shitty versions from outdated history textbooks. A lot of us live in cities now. This is just supposed to be like a way to start telling this other story, end quote. This other story is an alternate narrative, an indigenous epistemological representation. This other story is a decolonial story. Thank you. Excellent work. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'll also point out that uh, we have uh, the participants in the session will be, we'll have some conversation and some Q&A after this, after the three presentations. Um, at this point, I'd like to move along and introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is um, Jennifer Dawes. She's a professor of English and chair of the Department of English, Humanities and Philosophy at Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls, Texas. 
Also, the collection that she's edited, Dark Tourism in the American West, was just published, was published by Paul Gray Macmillan in 2019, Jennifer Dawes. Thank you, Nick. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. The title of my presentation is Reflections on Dark Tourism and the Carceral Landscape in the American West. Prison tourism as a subject of academic study is a subset of dark tourism research. In 2017, Paul Grave Macmillan published a lengthy volume on prison tourism. Um, the Paul Grape Handbook to Prison Tourism as part of their dark tourism uh, titles. Much of the scholarship on prison tourism focuses upon the sites of the prisons and the way, ways in which they are presented as tourist attractions. In this essay, I consider two different types of sites of prison tourism, the physical places where carceral history is narrated and presented for public consumption and the virtual spaces that provide information, but on the surface seem to lack context. To narrow the scope of my study, I have focused specifically on the death penalty in Texas and how it is variously presented to the public at the Texas Prison Museum in Huntsville and on the websites of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and the Faces of Death Row feature on the Texas Tribune website. I argue that each space, whether physical or virtual, participates in a process of shaping information for public consumption that is informed by the recognition that the death penalty is not a neutral subject and simultaneously seeks to justify and or deflect the act of producing narrative about it. In his article, Reforming the Carceral Past, Historian Seth Brueggemann reflects on the challenges of shaping the public narrative and presentation of prisons, specifically using Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia as an example. He concludes, all museums are branded by the moment in which they are born. They carry with them the politics of those who shape their public roles. The idea, this idea is never more apparent than at the Texas Prison Museum in Huntsville. Home to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and the site of all Texas executions, Huntsville itself is thoroughly enmeshed in the prison industrial complex. The fortress-like Texas State Penitentiary nicknamed the Walls Unit for the formidable red brick walls that surround it, is situated smack dab in the middle of town, just a few blocks from the HEB grocery store and not far down the road from Sam Houston State University. The TDCJ is the single largest employer in Huntsville with approximately 6,700 employees. The Texas Prison Museum, which opened in 1989, is not on the actual site of the prison, nor is it affiliated with the prison. Instead, it is conveniently situated off Interstate 45 before you get into Huntsville proper, providing easy access for the casually curious tourist. As smaller, muse as smaller local museums go, it is middling in both size and quality. The building itself is nondescript. Entering through the gift shop, the tourist encounters souvenirs, many of them handcrafted by the prisoners, as well as books, t-shirts, and DVDs for sale. The visitor is first offered the opportunity to view a short video about the genesis and development of the Texas prison system. Notably, the film avoids controversy of any kind or any kind of negative commentary on the Texas prison system. For instance, the court case Ruiz v. Estelle 
that led to better prison conditions and taxes is mentioned, but the impetus for it, abuse, overcrowding, poor health care, is not described in detail. Instead, the video emphasizes the vastness of the Texas prison system. Hannah Thurston writes about the film in her essay in the Paul Gray collection. While Texas is depicted as a place of punishment, it is not to suggest the story is about failure or an inability to manage criminality. On the contrary, this is a lesson to other states or other countries about how to deal with crime and criminals. There is an air of confidence, bravado even, within the stories. Moving on from the film seating area, one encounters a series of sections of the museum that deal with a variety of topics, including famous inmates, for instance, Clyde Barrow and Lead Belly, restriction devices like the, the ball and chain, um, prison uniforms, and then the Texas prison rodeo, which I wish I would have gotten a picture of the display there. Um, the Texas prison rodeo from 1931 to 1986 helped to provide funding for inmate recreational and ed educational activities. Like the omission of details about Ruiz, the display does not provide context for why the inmates needed to perform beyond just needing the money for things considered extra. The display notes that when federal funding began to provide for the educational and recreational needs of prisoners, the rodeo was discontinued. The central feature of the museum and the one I suspect most tourists come to see is Old Sparky, the original electric chair used to execute 361 prisoners from 1924 to 1964. The chair is located in a section of the museum toward the back and off to the side. Like the featured display at a circus sideshow, the chair inhabits its own space in the entrails of the museum and is not visible at the entrance. It is staged in a lifelike room with only a single narrative panel to provide its context. It needs none, of course. In her article, Thurston describes the presentation of the chair. The glass wall and ropes which protect the chair encourage the audience to see it as both mysterious and antiquated. Not just an object, the museum presents the chair as an artifact. The antiquated nature of the display seems to present a passage of time narrative. The gist is, this is what happened in the past. We do things differently now. The narrative panel provides the history of the chair and describes electrocution itself as riding the thunderbolt ascribing agency to the executed inmate and even a certain devil may care heroism. Strangely, on the day I was there, as I walked toward the display ground as if to provide electrified sound effects for the display, this rhythmic clicking sound was particularly unnerving as I was alone in the exhibit at the time and there were only a few other visitors in the museum. Upon wandering behind the walls of the execution room, I discovered that the sound is the un unintentional effect of a display of wooden objects handcrafted by inmates, one of which appears to be an electrified mallet perpetually swinging toward a ball that is not there. While Thurston views the overarching narrative of the museum as the story of reform and progress that emphasizes the civilized nature of modern punishment, and I agree with her, I would add that the museum also posits a vision of incarceration and particularly the death penalty as one based upon inevitability, as if the inmate plus his actions, and most of the uh, those who have been put to death have been male. Um, the inmate plus his actions are part of an equation that ineluctably equals execution. This removes um, a sense of agency from the state, the system, and the individual employees of the system. While vocal opposition to the death penalty is obviously a feature of American life, very little space is given to alternative voices, and even those arguments are shaped to appear un-American. 
Perhaps the strangest display in the museum is in one small cabinet that holds execution needles, a rope, a placard from the Texas Coalition to abolish the death penalty, a burned American flag, and two pictures of executed inmates, Carla Faye Tucker and Gary Graham, who notably changed his name to Shaka Sankofa while in prison, a name the exhibit fails to use or mention. As Elizabeth Nusser notes in her article in the Paul Grave Collection, the display provides no ex explanation of why these executions were controversial, no explanation of why someone would be opposed to the death penalty in gen generally, and no space is created here to represent intelligent, cogent dissent. Visitors exit the building in the same place they have entered it, through the gift shop, where inmate crafted rocking horses share space with kitschy t-shirts that range from the silly Texas Prison Museum, bed and breakfast, hard time in, three hots and a cot, to the tasteless, riding Thunderbolt, home of old Sparky. Thurston notes that the quote, comic tone serves to normalize the more severe elements of Texas, Texan punishment practices. While there are a few more serious items in the gift shop, books, DVDs, et cetera, the ones most prominently displayed, the handicrafts and t-shirts provide an odd pairing of industry and comedy. In contrast to the Texas Prison Museum, the death, death Row Information website of the De Texas Department of Criminal Justice and the Faces of Death Row feature on the Texas Tribune page both offer far less mediated experiences of Texas Death Row. The TDCJ site primarily and naturally serves a purely informational function, providing detailed lists of people currently on death row, people whose executions have been set and people who have already been executed. There are also sections that provide information for the news media and for crime victims. Everything is presented as straightforward information with little context beyond just the facts. In contrast, the Texas Tribune Faces of Death Row website presents information to the public as a form of public accountability a kind of witnessing of lawful death. The Texas Tribune tracks both the actual executions and the numbers of execution drugs the state of Texas has in stock. The site features a header that allows the viewer to filter inmate information based on years on death row, race, age, sex, county of crime, and whether or not their execution is scheduled. The purpose of the site is clear from the blurb at the top of the page that mentions Texas's preeminence in executions, the inmate cheers on death row, and the high numbers of black inmates um, on death row. Scrolling down the page, line after line of inmate photographs make the last point apparent. The photographs of the inmates are clickable links that provide information about each inmate. The execution drug tracker is touted as a new feature on the website. The tracker provides information about numbers of drugs, expiration dates, and scheduled executions, as well as context surrounding the use of lethal drugs for execution. As well-known pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer refuse to supply drugs for executions anymore, the state has been forced to seek out compounding pharmacies for their supply. While a 2015 Texas law ensured the privacy of anyone involved in an execution, the Tribune's stated purpose in providing the drug information is to, quote, promote transparency. The site describes how the state provides for a sufficient quantity of drugs by, quote, repeatedly extending the expiration dates of doses in stock. In another separate article on the Texas Tribune website, reporter Jolie McCullough, who is also responsible for the um, faces of death row and the execution tracker, um, she wrote about the most recent 
um, execution that of Quentin Jones just a few weeks ago on May 19th. Um, and it was the first execution in more than 40 years that was not witnessed by the media. Um, while a TDCJ representative claimed that the oversight was simply the result of an error in communication, McCullough in her article explains the reason for media attendance as a form of accountability. She writes, quote, in recent years, several Texas inmates have stated that the drugs burn after their final statement is concluded or jerks their bodies, according to media reports. The reports in part prompted legal filings against what death penalty defense attorneys called tortuous executions using old lethal injection drugs. Texas has repeatedly extended the expiration dates of its execution drugs after retesting their potency, end quote. The news reporters present at executions have been key in providing the public with detailed information about the executions that is not presented in the TDCJ reports about the execution. A AP reporter Michael Grachik has witnessed and written about 442 of the 571 executions in Texas since the early 80s. Grachik claims, if there is a botched execution, I think it is important for someone like me to be there and explain, here's what happened. The act of witnessing, however difficult, is vital. The sites of information about incarceration, incarceration and death row in Texas, the physical locations and the virtual spaces provide useful case studies of the various perspectives on the issue of the death penalty and how information is shaped for public presentation. The act of providing information is contextualized in a variety of ways from the emphasis on the inevitability of the death penalty that permeates the Texas Prison Museum to the focus on accountability in sites like the Texas Tribune's Faces of Death. The dark tourist, both on site and in the virtual world, becomes a kind of witness to our nation's darkest and most difficult acts. Thank you. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Jennifer. That was uh, very interesting. I'm, I look forward to some of the conversation that we're going to have afterwards. Uh, same with Scott's paper, too. I didn't neglect to mention earlier. Thank you. I'll move on now to our third presenter. Jennifer Tuttle is the Dorothy M. Healy Professor of Literature and Health at the University of New England, where she directs the Maine Women Writers Collection, an archive of women's cultural production in and about Maine. Her published work includes three edited or co-edited books on Charlotte Perkins Gilman, including the first recovered edition of Gilman's 1911 Western, The Crux, along with myriad articles and essays on American women's writing and literary recovery, archival studies, health humanities, and the US West. Her presentation today is taken from a chapter in the forthcoming volume, The Routledge Companion to Gender and the West, edited by Susan Bernardin. Today's talk is also drawn from her current book in process titled Unsettled Empire, American Nervousness in California Women's Writing. Jennifer is also a former editor and co-editor of Legacy, a journal of American women writers. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Nick, for all you've done to organize this and for getting up so early. <laughs> Just really, and thanks to everyone who's here. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see my PowerPoint. Okay. So the title of my talk is Riding the Rails in Edith Eaton's West. In 1903, Edith Maud Eaton moved from Seattle to Los Angeles to assume a post as journalist and stenographer at the California promotional newspaper, the Los Angeles Express. This was Eaton's second stint in LA and only her latest move in an itinerant existence that ranged from the Atlantic and Caribbean worlds across North America to the Pacific coast. Since passing my 20th year, 
she confessed to Charles Fletcher Lummis in 1900, I have been a sort of rolling stone. I'm always coming home and going away. Born in England to a Chinese mother and white British father, raised in the US and Canada, Eaton characterized herself autobiographically as a Eurasian woman, yet marked herself textually via diverse pen names in myriad registers of race and gender. She's best known for her work published as Sui Sin Far. The theme of motion provides an apt framework for interpreting Eaton's only known travelogue, Wing Sing of Los Angeles on his travels, published serially in the LA Express between February and July of 1904. Although Eaton herself undertook the journey described in the narrative, the author is identified as a merchant using the pen name Wing Sing, who recounts his effortless movement largely by rail from west to east and west again, as well as back and forth across the US Canadian border. Eaton uses this figure of the California merchant to imply a counter narrative to exclusion and defy racial fantasies about the American body politic while also charting the outer boundaries of Chinese agency in North America. While in Los Angeles, Eaton continued to produce the sympathetic ethnographic journalism on behalf of Chinese immigrant communities that she had undertaken along with similar short fiction elsewhere. Although she moved in and out of the United States over the course of her life, she pursued the entirety of this work from her first publication in the late 1880s until her death in 1914 in the shadow of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Eaton would have noted at the time the increasing tensions between the United States imperial ambitions in China and its draconian enforcement of Chinese exclusion at home. And she would have been all too aware that California, like other West Coast states, had long been a site of extrajudicial violence against the Chinese. The night raids, burnings, pogroms, and lynchings on a continuum with deportations, which Jean Feltzer accurately classifies as ethnic cleansing. Eaton's writing in and about Chinese California engages with its volatile political context reinscribing rejected and excluded Chinese bodies onto the American landscape. If Eaton deploys Wing Sing's rail travel as the principal means for enacting the mobility of Chinese subjects, then her venue was well chosen. The LA Express explicitly embodied the railroad in multiple ways. The paper had been founded in 1871 amid a boom of intra-California railway development, and its early mastheads provided a visual reference for the paper's name, centering an image of a moving locomotive. It was financed by reformer capitalist Edwin T. Earle, California's pioneer fruit shipper, who had made millions on the Continental Fruit Express Company, having invented a new ventilated refrigerator car to handle its shipments east. So Earl capitalized on the railroad's multi-directional circulation of bodies, goods, and fantasies as it amplified promotional discourses boosting California as an Edenic land of plenty, post-bellum national healing and white racial regeneration. Under Earl's ownership, the newspaper fully realized the symbolism of its name partaking of the symbiosis between railroads and newspapers, the Express not only literally ran on profits derived from railway technology, but also promoted the railroad, real estate, and tourism industries in its pages, where readers could find daily updates on California fruit export yields, but nary a word about the Chinese laborers who built the railway and Western agricultural infrastructure that enabled white, resettlement, um, white settlement and resource extraction. Narrating her rail journey as Wing Sing, Eaton obtained free passage in exchange for promotion. So like many Western travel writers, uh, she paid her fare in praise, but she also used the express as a print vehicle for Chinese appropriation of both the railroad and the travel log. 
So I would argue that she subverts their tandem role as instruments of conquest and white supremacy. Wing Sing is introduced by the editor of The Express as, quote, a well-known Americanized Chinese merchant from Los Angeles. And as such, he's a convenient narrator for the story that Eaton seeks to tell uh, because he's free to travel uh, across national borders um, and within the space of the United States. Although exempt from the exclusion that bedeviled laborers, merchants still endured rampant xenophobia, including the pathologization and racialization and surveillance of Chinese bodies. And merchants were also, as Arnold Pond puts it, middlemen in international East-West commerce. Chinese immigrant merchants like Wing Sing were thus liminal figures who embodied corporeal and geopolitical contradictions. As I will presently show, in choosing this California merchant, this middleman, as her narrator and booking in passage on the railway, Eaton invests in a thematic of motion. From this vantage point, um, Wing Sing sitting on the train, he mediates across categories of race, class, and gender in a challenge to the surveillance technologies of exclusion. Although he's a merchant, and this is kind of the overall structure and thesis of my, my longer essay. Um, so he's a merchant, uh, but in the first eastward trajectory of his journey, he embodies and articulates grievances of excluded Chinese laborers with whom he shares racialized status. Although he's a Chinese, on his return voyage west, he undertakes an elite settler colonial venture, appropriating a corporeality coded as white. Wing Sing is then a capacious figure through whom Eaton implots a subversive and a brilliant Chinese mobility that exceeds both the orthodoxies of exclusion and the prevailing mythologies of the West. The Eastern trajectory of Wing Sing's journey begins in Los Angeles and ends in New York City and overtly replays common tropes of elite rail travel. Because my focus today is on his westward journey, I have time only to summarize my claim about the eastbound segment. Wing Sing moves north from LA to San Francisco by rail, then to Washington State by steamship, then from Seattle to Vancouver, Canada, again by rail. He proceeds to travel east to Montreal on the Canadian Pacific Railway. Then he moves south to Manhattan, also by train. As Mary Chapman has observed, in this itinerary, culminating in the crossing into New York, Eaton invokes the route by which Chinese laborers, unable to enter the US at Western ports, were smuggled in, often posing as merchants and moving openly by rail. Eaton thereby indicts and activates exclusion's racialization of Chinese bodies across class. Eaton's portrayal of Wing Sing renders him a proxy for Chinese laborers using exclusion's very pan-Chinese corporeality to defy its mechanisms and meaning. Wing Sing uses this strategy in the obverse when he turns his compass westward returning to Seattle by train with the final projected destination of LA and correspondingly associates his travels with improved health. He now recapitulates tropes associated with Anglo-American rail travel westward, assuming the prerogative of white settler colonists whose internal migration was promoted by not only railroads and real estate capitalists, but the medical establishment, which regularly marketed California as the nation's health resort. He also upends the sinophobic discourse conflating Chinese immigrants with illness and infection. Wing Sing claims instead the role of a leisured Anglo neurasthenic who seeks to restore his depleted nerve force and thus remain fit for racial and cultural supremacy through travel, his imperial gaze surveying the country from a Pullman car. From the comfort of his first class accommodation Wing Sing asserts on more than one occasion that the train journey has improved his health. Late in his narrative, he remarks, 
I feel much superior man. The car it much agree with the sense. I think I gained six pounds since I leave Vancouver. Western health tourism and health related migration were common if class bound phenomena during this time. Moreover, like settler colonialism, they typically employed the organizing grammar of race to use Patrick Wolf's phrase. The nervousness and work related exhaustion that set Wing Sing in motion were considered marks of distinction of whiteness, refinement, and elite class status. In particular, Wing Sing explicitly appropriates prevailing medical discourse directed at elite white men, exemplified in neurologist S. Weir Mitchell's popular volume, Wear and Tear, or Hints for the Overworked. Uh, this book cautioned the, quote, man of business that unceasing labor imperiled his nervous system. In his practice, Mitchell sought to restore ill businessmen to productivity, often prescribing a regimen of travel. Wing Sing likewise opens his travelogue by establishing its impetus in overwork. Quote, for 10 year, I work very hard. Then I say to me, Wing Sing, not good work too hard, perhaps you may take holiday, unquote. And like many of the nervous American elite, he's confident that at the end of his sojourn, he will be, quote, plenty refreshed to come back to his business, unquote. Wing Sang's merchant status aligns him with the American businessman, a position from which he then claims the prerogative of contingent whiteness. Further, in framing his travel in this way, Wing Sang counters the imagined gender and sexual deviance attributed to Chinese men in exclusion discourse. He said he associates himself with white manliness embodied by the likes of Teddy Roosevelt, whose iconic cowboy exploits Wing Sing refers to um, when the train passes through North Dakota. With his mention of Roosevelt, a famous practitioner of restorative Western travel, Wing Sing signals that his westbound journey partakes of these phenomena and that it will imply a critique of American settler colonial mythologies. On the surface, of course, is the obvious association of Roosevelt with the West's recuperative function, a theme Wing Sang drives home when the train passes through Billings, Montana. The city, he reports, called my mind the Virginian. Young woman read that story to me one time. She say the man who wrote it is named Owen Wister. And he make a very good tale. As Eaton's readers would have known, Wister's novel, The Virginian, a prototypical Western, is a famous fictional account of what Barbara Will and I have called a West cure, Mitchell's treatment for ailing men like those described in Wear and Tear, prescribing travel, especially to the US West, as a cure for nervousness and its attendant feminizations. Wing Sing's mention of Wister, whose own West cure fictionalized in the novel was prescribed by Mitchell, quite simply makes his gesture toward the West cure too obvious to miss. Wing Sing playfully appropriates the West cure, putting himself on a corporeal continuum with nervous white businessmen, yet he also reserves the right to indict the settler colonial mythology that Western health tourism both affected and justified. He activates this by bracketing this section of his train journey with references to US military conquest. Immediately before his mention of the Virginian, he alludes to the Great Sioux War of 1876 and 77, which he remarks means much more to you who are Americans than it does to Chinese immigrants like himself who are less familiar with this history. Correspondingly, after invoking Wister's novel, Wing Sing critiques the expendability of the US quote, colored troops stationed at Fort Harrison veterans of not only so-called Indian wars, but also of recent US imperial campaigns in Cuba and the Philippines, where many reportedly identified with the plight of the Filipino fighters, it was their mission to repress. As this train moves westward then, Wing Sing asserts a Chinese subjectivity that rejects the medical orthodoxies of exclusion. Far from embodying yellow peril pathologies of pollution and disease, he appropriates a nervous corporeality associated with health-seeking whiteness. And this nervousness signals Wing Sing's unsettled state, asserting yet again his liminality and mobility across categories. 
having gained access to this privileged position, he recapitulates one of the practices of US territorial expansion, troubling prevailing narratives of settler colonialism at home and imperialism abroad from the comfort of his luxury rail car. Beyond the content and venue of the Wing Zang travelogue, the very circumstances of its composition assert the unsettling transits of Chinese subjects. Given that Eaton herself undertook the journey from Los Angeles that she recounts contemporaneously as Wing Sing. Again, time prevents me from exploring the myriad implications of this, but I mention it merely to register that like Wing Sing's, Eaton's body becomes a conduit for foregrounding the experiences and charting the mobility of myriad Chinese subjects within North America and across its borders, inhabiting thresholds between categories of gender, race, and class. In the travelogue's first installment, the editor tells readers that Wing Sing is, quote, the pen name of an Americanized Chinese merchant in this city. In other words, it is Eaton herself who is that Americanized merchant. Just as Chinese merchants were middlemen navigating the tensions of exclusion, so Eaton serves such a function. And while this mediating role gives Eaton a platform for advocacy, it also exacts a heavy toll, something she explores at length in her autobiographical writing, where she discusses the nervous sickness that she attributes to bearing the cross of the Eurasian as the imperiled connecting link between East and West. Wing Sang of Los Angeles on his travels, only recently made easily available in reprint thanks to Mary Chapman's excellent recovery work and thus seldom studied, is a unique and important piece of Eaton's over that warrants further critical attention. It complicates our understanding of her literary use of the merchant figure, her advocacy for Chinese communities in the West, her protean negotiation of print culture, and her autobiographical self-construction as an intersectional subject. It also exemplifies how her writing in and about California defies the prevailing orientation of an American empire looking West, exploiting the movement allowed by the railway and the travelogue she foregrounds the perspectives of Chinese subjects who venture eastward to and from California, across oceans and national frontiers, and whose nervous bodies move freely in anti-imperial transits. Eaton situates California not as a site of contagion from the east or a gateway to US imperial dominance in the Pacific, but as a nexus of vibrant, mobile, invested Chinese subjectivity in North America that counters and exceeds prevailing mythologies of the West. Attending to Eaton's work, therefore, may help to reorient critical paradigms about California's place in the national imaginary and the larger Pacific realm. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Scott. That was uh, three very, very engaging and interesting papers. I've got a full notepad full of questions and, and thoughts and, and look forward to some conversation. At, at this point, as is our want, we will uh, throw it open to the gallery and the gathering, I should say, and uh, well, I just clicked gallery view up here. Um, throw it to the, uh, the gathering and uh, we can uh, have some conversation. I see uh, a hand, Katie. Um, all right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I, I enjoyed listening to those. Um, so I have a kind of a cluster of related questions for Jennifer. Um, that was great, Jennifer, and gave me a lot to think about. And I, I like it so, I like the way this, you know, you're taking this kind of kind of bizarre, fun text, it's all quirky, and then you're really like loading it up with some heavy, heavy work and, and argument. Um, so that's that's impressive, and I look forward to reading that when it's done in your whole book. Um, so your related questions, um, you know, you refer to, it, it was funny at the very moment where you had the phrase about the organizing grammar of race, it was at the same time on your, your um, screen, you had 
was actually the first quotation that you gave us from the Texas South, and that came pretty late in your talk, right? Um, in which we see that really butchered grammar. I feel much superior man. I think I gained six pounds, et cetera, et cetera. And I've read other of her representations of you know Chinese American English that, as I remember, weren't quite as bad as that. <laughs> you know, they they sound so. I mean, so the one question I had was, you know, how you deal with with what she's doing here. Um, with, with the language that she's giving him. And I wonder if the whole book is written like that, um, which leads me to my second question, which is, you know, clearly there's a lot for an academic to talk about with this book, you know, endlessly as, as you've shown. I wonder if it's a good read and just pleasurable to read page by page. Um, and, then, and then just thirdly, as just an aside, a, 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 a book that this reminds me of a lot is Yone Noguchi's American Diary of a Japanese Girl, where here we have a Japanese man pretending to be a Japanese girl who is also in California, also taking doing some rail travel, um, also having some idiosyncratic English. Although in his case, that that was his own English that you know as he had learned it, so a little bit different. So that's sort of my cluster of thoughts about that. Thanks, Katie. Those are really, really interesting questions and wonderful insights and comments. Um, I think it's so interesting that uh, the accidental confluence of the quotation about <laughs> and that quotation. And I will tell you, frankly, that you know this is not an unproblematic text. There's so much that I did not have time to talk about today. Um, but, you know, um, increasingly as we learn more about what Eaton published, you know, when she was first recovered for the modern age, we, we talked about her as Sui Sin Far and we thought that that was who she was. And then we increasingly came to realize that you know, well, really, that was a pen name very distinct from her autobiographical identity. And then further, we came to realize that, no, I mean, every single day, right, there's more and more of her work being recovered, um, where we realize that she's writing under all of these different guises and different pen names, and different types of characters. And, you know, um, there's a, a, a way in which her embodiment of this Chinese subjectivity that's marked as Chinese, it's interestingly very different from the Sui Sin Far pen name, where there is not this kind of, um, where, where there's this very assimilated, right, kind of um, standard, standardized uh, kind of grammar that this, that her voice uses, whereas with Wing saying it's much more of a caricature, and um, it's it it's troubling in that sense. Uh, and so, you know, I think that this is so we're we're still young in the scholarly conversation about this text. I mean, it's been we've known about it for decades, but it has not been in any way easily available, especially not altogether. And so. You know, I'm really going to be looking forward to seeing what other people do with it and what what uh, directions they take. Um, for my case, I will just say that uh, the the broken sort of dialect voice that she uses for Wing Sing is part of the what I think I imagine she imagines as a uh, part of his kind of playful, ebullient persona. Um, there's a way in which, you know, I'm still trying to figure out to get a read on it. I think there's one way in which you could say that she, and he does this in the text a few times. She is purposely sort of putting in readers' faces their stereotypes about Chinese men and Chinese immigrants, but especially Chinese men um, and then kind of slyly, ironically calling them on it. But it's a really kind of um, 
slippery moment because she's also reproducing those same stereotypes, which again, based on her background and the, the kind of aspirational class status of her family, um, you know, doesn't entirely surprise me. So um, I'm ambivalent about that. I think the text is ambivalent about it. I don't think it fully works in the way she intends if I, if I read her right and I may not. Um, so, but, it, but your question is um, leading me to, I, I really wanna think more about it in the context of wolf because that is kind of blowing my mind. Context of what? The wolf, the quote about the organizing grammar of race. <laughs> I'm just so, my, my, there are explosions going off in my head right now that I need what more time to think about. And you withheld your quotations. I mean, that's a pretty late time into a paper to, for, to give us a, a line. Yeah, the reason I did that though actually doesn't have to do with anything relating to the content, but it simply was that I needed to set it all up first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, then the section that I chose to go into with a little bit of evidence, it's a much longer piece that I'm condensing, mm -hmm. was the, the second part, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's why in this presentation, Mm -hmm. I did it that way. And that's why you think you did it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been incoherent had I done it the other way. But it, obviously, it's part of a longer piece. So in the published work, I quote from him earlier, but it just simply wasn't mm -hmm. relevant. Um, that Noguchi book was written in 1902. Oh, yeah, that's thank you. I forgot about that. That is a really, really interesting connection to before mm -hmm. I don't know if there is anyone who has written about that in comparison to Eaton um, no, no I don't there hasn't been I, I don't remember anything put to anybody putting those two things together well they should yeah I mean <laughs> <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I'm done with Noguchi. I'm here working on the American Diary of a Japanese Girl and I'm done. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are, there's really a lot of links between that book and, and, and the one you just talked about. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I'm going to kind of think about that again. I really, I really appreciate your questions are giving me lots of food for thought. Very good. If I may, I'd like to... Uh jump in here and ask a question of Scott. Um, bring this back around to some of our other conversations. Uh, Scott, a fascinating read, and I'm looking forward to reading this novel. I haven't picked it up yet, because um, it's always struck me that, um, I think you you had a quote from the main character of There, There, about all we have is you know, just these, what do they call it, like tired reservation stories or such things. Yes. I was actually, up until you made Ram mention that quote, was wondering what how in a sort of meta-literary way or uh, self-referential way there there situates itself against some of the chestnuts of of uh, most syllabi that most academics put together to teach Native American literature, which would include, say, a Mama Day or, a, you know, Silco and some of these others that have given rise to this idea that, that recovering a particular kind of place is a particular kind of identity recovery and how it how this how there there situates itself there particularly i was thinking of mama day which which has a very lengthy urban section in in um uh, um uh, house made of dawn house made of dawn thank you so the, the name was just escaping me and that's now recorded in indelibly for the rest of history right here but <laughs> <laughs> but i was wondering about that connection about sort of how Aside from that, just that quotation, how the text itself uh, plays with that uh, connection or that that history. Uh, sure, that's a great question, Nick. You know, in this the survey, uh, Indigenous literature surveys, you'll have um, the you know initial forebears of the Native American literary renaissance, like Mama Day and Silco and uh, James Wells that you mentioned, and then you have this different and how people want to categorize them: new waves of of, of literature and poetry that are coming out. And you know, uh, Orange's novel uh, sets itself um, to to be sort of in contradistinction to I think ongoing misrepresentations of uh, of Native American uh, life in 2021. I mean, the novel uh, came out a few years ago and was of course runner up for the Pulitzer uh, 
for the full surprise. But you know, Tommy has stated over and over that his intended audience was uh, was for Native Americans, but he anticipates non-Native readers throughout, particularly as I mentioned with the interlude in the prologue. And so it's it's not. Uh, he said in an interview uh, that I read that you know he that 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 he and the people that he were engaged with in Oakland and and the Bay Area never get away from the reservation. And yet they have a, a, a way of being in a life that is distant in so many places from you know, what we might consider to be traditional rural uh, Native American experience. And so when he has that quote, you know, the first one that I'd put up, the land is everywhere or nowhere, I think he's wanting to, um, you know, offer a counter discourse. And then when he says, all we have are these uh, stories, um, these outdated history, textbooks you know he's he's wanting to set this entire interwoven uh, set of narratives of these 13 or 14 different perspectives um in contradistinction to that sort of um to that sort of presumed way of of understanding native americans as from the past or archaic or outdated or extinct or vanishing and the novel utilizes uh, you know an urban setting and then even more so, um, it seems that the author really intentionally utilized digital uh, networking and spaces and, and non-traditional thinking about place to say, um, there, there are other stories that need to be told that need to be heard. And so I think in that regard, it does set, the novel itself sets it and then um, contemporary indigenous existence in contradistinction to those harmful and outdated representations. I'm fascinated by the idea of a of a novel fictionalizing digital spaces and online experiences. I'm assuming this pro I don't know if, if if there's an e version of this novel available one can read on one's iPad if there are links and things. There is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've got I've got the Kindle version too, so it's helpful. <laughs> and and, and is it hyperlinked or is it just rendered in the way a Kindle would say render, you know, great expectations or something like that. <laughs> it's it's yeah, it's 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 a multimodal, so you never okay, wish. cool. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Well uh, Jennifer Dawes, um I was curious uh and I won't go into the background for why, but um was old Sparky, you said that was used till 1964. Yeah, I believe that was the the date. Was that the year that Texas banned the um, electric chair? You know, was that when the end of it? Because okay, I will get there it. There was a shift. I mean, there was a <laughs> shift, but you know, the the most recent executions didn't start back up again until the eighties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I believe it was. So you know, there was a there was a hiatus there for a period of time. And then there's obviously been this shift to a more kind of um, hygienic death, so to mm -hmm, speak, mm -hmm. lethal injection. Um, yeah. But of course, as you see, there's problems with that as well. Of course, I can look that up, I suppose, easily enough too. Yeah. But um, I was curious because McCarthy in um, No Country for Old Men um, has uh, Sheriff Ed Tom Bell, a novel set around 1980, um, uh, the beginning of the Reagan years, not by accident, I don't think, but Bell um, talks about attending an electrocution. And then somebody had pointed out in one of the articles I read that uh, there were no electrocutions at the time, supposedly. But yeah, no. Uh, again, if he names the year, because Bell's been sheriff long enough, it could have been before 62 um, or 64, excuse me. So, I don't well, know. it's such a visual image, you know, and, and to use that, even if it's not historically accurate, I mean, you use that for a reason. Electrocution is so mm -hmm. much more visceral, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Well, Hemingway's poetry, it's the same sort of thing. And I'm sure Hem McCarthy's aware of that with his Hemingway connections. But I was curious in terms of the literal aspect of that um and uh, uh it wouldn't have been the age business. Sure. I'm sorry. definitely definitely decommissioned by then yeah and i was wondering if you might be okay with you if you shared your uh, reason for being so interested in 
Huntsville and, and all. Oh, well, and I, I debated whether or not to talk about this in the essay because it feels very like confessional, but I had a very good friend on death row and who has since been executed. And so it made me um, more interested. I also was involved with the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty um, back when I first lived in Texas. And so that's part of my impetus for working on this, but I also am hoping to uh, work on a collection of essays about dark tourism in Texas. Um, since I was gonna do Arkansas, I was living in Arkansas. I'm living in Texas now, so now it's Texas. So uh, that, that those are kind of my multiple uh, reasons for that. When he was one of the 44% of African Americans, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so I, I, when I ultimately uh, write, you know, what I would think of as more of a publishable version of this essay, I plan to include a mention of that. I'm not exactly sure how. Um, I'm not sure I'm ready to emotionally process a lot of that because uh, it's going to take some emotional work as well. But you know, I've got I've got all the materials, and we'll see. We'll see where that goes. Jennifer, are you familiar with the work of John Dorst? D O R S T. No, I'm not. Um, and actually, this is, I, oddly enough, this works for both Jennifers. Um, uh, He's at, uh, or was, I don't know what, he's, what his status is right now. He was at the University of Wyoming and he published an amazing book called Looking West, which has a couple of chapters on uh, Worcester and the West Cure. And, and, and I, Jennifer, I love that. I've always used that phrase. I think it's fantastic, the West Cure. Um, but he's also got a chapter on the museum in somewhere in semi-rural Wyoming that is dedicated to preserving the memory of when uh, Butch Cassidy stayed there. Um, and, and then there's one more chapter in this book about historical reconstruction fairs um, and historical reconstruction societies. And what he does is he talks about the West, the, the physical space and the concept as a place that is fundamentally subject to scopophilia, which is something that is the consumed through looking. And, and what you talked about in the ways in which the Texas P uh, Prison Museum sets up a sort of, uh, on the one hand, eliminates the ability to witness for the purpose of accountability and yet presents visually a story that is ultimately one about narrating history in a certain way that's favorable to one party or another. Um, it's very much in keeping with this idea of uh, the consumption of the West through the gaze and in the carceral context, certainly when uh, Doris talks about in his chapter on Butch Cassidy and the prison in Wyoming, I can't remember the name of it, um, the ways in which some of the yards around the, the building are like, like little all-American white picket fence, roses climbing and little, the way the garden is tended visually to become a part of a normalizing story and in the way in which, uh, yeah, Butch Cassidy's tenure at a prison in Wyoming is, is something to be consumed visually and understood in that way. And in the way, all the ways in which that sort of takes out any accountability and, and takes out any sort of uh, references to the, the complications of, uh, of um, the, uh, the carceral system. So you might want to take a look at that book um, because it's, it's, they're highly readable, underappreciated, I think, masterpiece of uh, scholarship in, on the American West. Yeah, it's really good. And it's and it's also rather brief, too. <laughs> Looking West. It's, it's published by Penn, University of Pennsylvania Press. Are you referring to Rollins Prison in Wyoming? I think that's it, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, an interesting Rollins, yeah. place. They've got their own sort of shrine, et cetera, there, too. It's really mm -hmm. kind of yep. cool disturbing as well yes <laughs> i think doris is actually reading the shrine um and then just down the road from me of course is sundance which supposedly is named after you know what is it after the sundance or is it after the sundance kid there's controversy about that but uh, that's in wyoming too and then you've got where they uh, the the hole in the wall uh, stuff was out near the bighorns mm -hmm. keystone maybe i think it is but, but Jennifer, it, it brought up to me this question about, uh, it's not so much a question, but about interesting in which I, I hesitate to go down this road because I think the work that the, the free media and the, uh, the independent media do in, in holding executioners accountable for their actions is vital. But there's all, it's this a sort of double-edged, you know, on both sides, because it also contributes to the visualizing and visualization of 
the practice and certainly in the ways that the state sometimes can uh, leverage it's it's the press access um but not the, i don't for a second want to say that uh, we, we shouldn't be witnessing but the very act of witnessing at some times can actually become part of the whole engine of, of uh, scopophilia in these sorts of things I, it that's not a question for you so much just a comment that that, that came to mind is of the complexity of the issue well, it's, it's, you know, it is problematic. And especially when you have someone like um, Mike Grachik, who has been to so many of the executions and, and um, he talks about it, he's actually Catholic, which is an interesting, uh, you know, kind of combination. He talks about, you know, how do you witness this and still, you know, hold certain beliefs and witness at the same time. And really this most recent execution when there were no media witnesses is I'm still trying to yeah. I have not seen anything that really justifies that and I don't know what the story is there because I, I remember when um, we used to you know go and protest the executions that you knew that the execution was going to happen when you saw the press um, walk across the street and go into the good bit because they strap the person down first, you know, they get them ready and then they bring people in. And so you knew at that point and people said, oh, look, there's the press, they're going in. And so it was a notable moment. Um, and the fact that it didn't happen this past time, it's, you know, it, but it's important though. I think it is extremely important that there's someone there, an impartial observer who can record what's happening. Um, and it, I think it'd be awful. Agreed. Be awful. Well, keeping with the word record, to make a, a stupidly ironic shift, maybe even an appropriate one. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that our session is supposed to last 75 minutes, and I don't remember what time it was when I clicked record, but I think we're just about there. <laughs> so what I'd like to do then is officially sign off and say thank you all again for this very engaging set of presentations. Um, um, the quality and caliber of uh, the Western Literature Association work continues to delight. And uh, I appreciate all your hard work and I will click stop recording and by so doing say thank you all very much and I wish you all well.